Good morning. I will now call the May 20th, 2022 San Diego County Board of Supervisors special meeting for the group budget presentation to order. I'll ask the court to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I'd like to note for the record that Supervisor Anderson is unable to attend today's session due to previously scheduled committee meetings. <laughs> With that, Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Here. Supervisor Desmond? Here. Vice Chair Vargas? Vargas, here. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher, here. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Agassi and team to uh, hear the presentation for the Land Use and Environment Group. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. I'm Sarah Agassi, and it is an honor and privilege to work beside the Land Use and Environment Group, six departments, and 1,855 dedicated staff. Today, we will be highlighting this amazing team's accomplishments and efforts to come in our proposed $619 million operational plan. Our team members come to work every day inspired to have a positive impact on the community we serve, and I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that these achievements come while our staff continue to balance the same personal and professional challenges our community members have faced these past few years. Their commitment to public service is awe-inspiring. Simply stated, the Luge mission is to protect the health and safety of residents and visitors and to preserve and enhance the natural environment. We like to say that if you work, live, or recreate anywhere in San Diego County, we are a part of county government that you likely interact with every day. Our programs are evaluated through the lens of equity, focusing on underserved communities and environmental justice and every Luge department is analyzing its programs to make sure unique neighborhood needs are being addressed. Some of our work spans across the entire region, serving 3.3 million residents and 35 million annual visitors, with services such as food safety inspections or protecting consumers. Yet, when it comes to land use decisions, stormwater management, or roads, our services are limited to the unincorporated community. This is an area with more than 500,000 residents and 2.2 million acres. It is the second largest municipality by population in the region and geographically larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined. Sustainability is at the heart of everything we do and our investment in sustainable programming continues to grow. In the past four years, the county has invested over $80 million in climate action measures that reduce greenhouse gases. In 2021, we reduced GHGs equal to removing 43,500 gas-powered cars from the road for one year. Last year's budget included $104 million to protect the climate and natural resources, and it is making a difference. We are the first county in the nation to have a regional decarbonization framework, or RDF. We are leading this collaborative effort across local boundaries to bring government, labor, business, and community representatives together to achieve zero carbon emissions by mid-century. This synergy will help the region achieve more meaningful climate action. While we are crafting our updated climate action plan, we continue to implement GHG reducing measures that conserve land and water, promote renewable energy, and reduce vehicle travel in the unincorporated area and at county facilities. And we helped all county departments across the enterprise and board offices create sustainability plans to reduce their carbon footprint. Our solar permit fee waivers have resulted in more than 64,000 permits in our unincorporated community since 2010 providing greater access and encouraging renewable energy use. And through new agreements with waste haulers, education and recycling efforts, we are diverting waste from our landfills. By teleworking since 2020, our six departments have eliminated six and a half million miles of driving, cutting tailpipe emissions to help our climate. Protecting our region's open space, habitat, farmland, wildlife, and water goes hand in hand with our climate work. We track and stop pollution from entering storm drains to protect the ocean and groundwater. In the past five years, the county has committed approximately $200 million to stormwater runoff management. We carefully analyze these investments to generate the greatest return for the community. For our new Green Streets projects, we use data and outreach to understand the needs of our neighborhoods when it comes to water quality, addressing pollution, and pedestrian access. 
We also increased parkland and trails for everyone's enjoyment with a focus on accessibility for all. And we have permanently set aside more than 3,000 acres of agricultural land. Our region's 5,100 farms are protected by inspections, including help from our famous dog teams that detect invasive pests before they spread diseases that could destroy local crops. Our land stewardship remains strong. Since its beginning in 1998, the county and its partners have invested $221 million and preserved 44,000 acres of land to protect and preserve the county's most sensitive plants and animals through our three multiple species conservation plan areas. Our teams are hard at work protecting the public's health and safety. On the same day, they could be plowing snow in the mountains, sampling water at our beaches, managing hazardous spills, and repairing roads and sidewalks. We maintain county roads and infrastructure that support commerce, emergency vehicles, and travel in our communities. To prevent diseases such as West Nile virus or Zika, we seasonally treat thousands of mosquito breeding sites. And because of our water sampling and public noticing, beachgoers know when it is safe to enter waters along 70 miles of San Diego County coastline. Our commitment to improving housing affordability for all remains firm. We support this by making it easier and more affordable to build an accessory dwelling unit by waiving related fees. And we continue to streamline the development and approval process and overhaul policies and regulations. Our services also strengthen consumer confidence and create an equitable marketplace. Agriculture Weights and Measures works to make sure consumers get what they pay for at stores and gas stations and verifies local fruits and vegetables are safe and healthy. And in support of the board's direction to facilitate more commercial cannabis operations in the unincorporated communities, we are identifying where they can be located and how they are allowed to operate. We've been instrumental in improving the quality of life in the region, operating parks and library branches that provide recreation and learning and strengthen the community's connection and physical and mental well-being. These spaces are important community hubs for our region's wonderfully diverse neighborhoods. Over the last year, we helped prepare 23 students for future sustainability-related jobs by providing internships in our departments. Reliable broadband internet is critical to modern life for economic opportunity, education, public safety and resilience, and access to healthcare professionals. But not all residents have this access based on income or location. To help close the digital divide, we are assessing gaps in connectivity and are actively surveying residents in the unincorporated community for their experiences to determine where we need more or better infrastructure, accessibility, and affordability. With these results, we will work with the public and private partners in the region to develop a comprehensive and equitable broadband plan to address this inequity in our underserved communities. So far, we've collaborated with Caltrans and Sandag to under underground fiber optic cable along State Route 67 to expand access to high quality broadband service for 225,000 rural and tribal residents. Now let's shift to what we have planned for the year ahead. We will be supporting the sustainability initiative of the county strategic plan with $113 million in the proposed budget. 33 million of this will advance an equitable, healthy climate for all. This includes moving the RDF toward implementation and updating our action, climate action plan for the unincorporated area and county facilities, which will align with the RDF. We've ordered 46 electric and hybrid vehicles to replace some of our gas or diesel run fleet. Teleworking and alternate work schedules will continue to balance employee well-being, reduce driving, and support our sustainability goals. We are also continuing our efforts to increase the use of shared office space to reduce our carbon footprint. San Diego County is one of the most biodiverse regions, uh, regions in the nation. With $73 million in this proposed budget for protecting our natural resources, we look forward to adding property to our MSCP areas, preserving more farmland, and finalizing the draft North County plan for board consideration. 
As more land is acquired, resources will be needed for the ongoing stewardship of these lands to preserve and protect habitat. Funding in this budget will also support the ongoing operation of our watershed protection program. And by dedicating $13.5 million in funding, we will continue to protect our vibrant $1.8 billion agricultural industry by thwarting destructive pests. The tangible loose services that support everyday life for residents and visitors align with the community strategic initiative. Our programs provide places to live, recreate and learn and safe roads on which to drive. We deliver water and sewer service to homes and businesses and inspect recreational water and food establishments. All of this requires a healthy investment of $224 million. Protecting consumers is even more important as residents are facing tighter household budgets and rising costs. This proposed budget includes nearly $9 million to protect their hard earned dollars. Our agriculture weights and measures team will verify the accuracy of 30,000 scanners, scales and pumps at area stores and gas stations and increase efforts to promote and expand the possibility of consumers using public benefits at certified farmers markets and community supported agriculture to increase access to local produce in underserved communities. We will promote and educate regarding the micro enterprise home kitchen operations program to expand opportunities in our communities to start a small scale home based food business. We support the community strategic initiative by funding safe and sustainable infrastructure for the unincorporated community with a $214 million investment. The breadth of infrastructure we maintain extends beyond our roads and work together to provide more accessibility for all residents and visitors. With $40 million in the proposed budget, we will support the county's focus on the community by protecting and promoting the health and safety of residents and visitors. We will prevent mosquito borne diseases by treating breeding sites and exposure to hazardous materials through collection events and inspections. To build greater service equity, we will do this with an emphasis on underserved communities and addressing environmental injustices. We will remain steadfast in our work to remedy the public health crisis in the Tijuana River Valley through water improvement and trash capture projects and our participation in the South County Environmental Justice Task Force. And we will reduce food waste and improve community access to fresh healthy food through the Live Well San Diego Food Systems Initiative and our departmental sustainability plans. We support the empower and equity tenants of the county strategic plan with $32 million in the proposed budget for programming that connects the lives of our residents. This includes nurturing justice, equity, diversity, inclusion and belonging among our staff so we can provide the highest level of service for our community members. We continue to invest in programming that ins inspires civic engagement helps people who faced hardship in life to refocus on their education, builds confidence among teenagers, teaches a new language, and translates core information into other languages to engage our non-English speaking community members. To accommodate those without an internet connection, we provide free Wi-Fi at library facilities, and this recommended budget includes federal funding to support new broadband connectivity projects. Throughout all luge departments, our continued analysis of where and how we provide our services will help us identify ways to reach more people more often and on more topics that impact their lives. We are unwavering when it comes to ensuring stakeholders have the information they need to engage with us and provide feedback on the programs and services that affect their community. By involving residents in county government, we learn more about their needs and can ultimately serve them better. We will continue to use our new public engagement platform that invites people to comment on documents, share their experiences, collaborate with others, and connect with team members to inform our decisions. To better understand and meet the needs of our community members and increase accountability, each luge department will continue to regularly assess their services, identify gaps and work with stakeholders on approaches to address the gaps and achieve better outcomes. We are dedicated to ensuring our data driven services are delivered equity, 
so all community members feel included. This approach drives our planning, outreach, and implementation, including our staff recruitment process, stakeholder outreach, and translation services. Our proposed budget increases by half a percent, or $3.3 million, and luge staffing increases by 9.2 percent, or 171 staff. The $3 million budget increase shown for next year is actually closer to $53 million, or almost a 10 percent increase, since $50 million in one-time funding for luge projects is accounted for in another area of the county budget and supports things such as tree planting, sidewalks, bike lanes, and stormwater management. Community engagement and evidence-based decision-making guides everything we do. In our proposed budget, you will see new positions embedded within each luge department to better serve the public, address inequities, and to support and focus on board priorities. We are also adding staff to address an increase in workload process key projects and complete inspections, as well as bringing services in-house that were previously performed by contractors. Moving people in-house is anticipated to save $5 million over the next five years. Chair Fletcher and Supervisors. Our programs are guided by stakeholder engagement and assessments of community needs to ensure all community members enjoy a safe and resilient natural and built environment for generations to come. Our entire team looks forward to helping the county build a better, more equitable, and sustainable future for all. And now, some of our incredible Team Luge leaders will provide a closer look at our programs and services. I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Morteza Baksamusa, who will share how our proposed budget supports the new Office of Sustainability and Environmental Justice. Thank you, Sarah. As part of the operational plan, and budget for fiscal year 22-23, we are proposing the creation of a new Office of Sustainability and Environmental Justice, or OSEJ, which will be led by a Chief Sustainability Officer. You may be thinking that this office sounds similar to the Office of Environmental and Climate Justice that was established by the board last year. It is true because some of the responsibilities of that office will be merged into OSEJ. OACJ will be housed within the Land Use and Environment Group in order to ensure the continuity of the sustainability efforts both within the county enterprise as well as throughout the region. Being housed within Luge does not mean that it, its focus will remain on land use and environmental issues alone. We are looking forward to embrace all the pillars of sustainability as they relate to the social, economic, health, and environmental well-being of our communities. And foundational to these pillars is the strategic initiative of the county, which has at its core principles the values of community, empowerment, sustainability, and justice. OACJ would lead regional sustainability initiatives, including its environmental justice or EJ work, moving the region towards zero carbon emissions and collaborating with our communities as well as local, state, and federal agencies that can support our work through funding and policy development. It will also coordinate departmental sustainability throughout the county, be home to the county's food system initiative and the county's tribal liaison position, a role created in last year's budget in order to further government-to-government -government relationships with the regions, each of the 18 tribal governments. Some of these functions are currently housed within the Land Use and Environment Group's Executive Office. During the past year, much work has begun, which lays a strong foundation for OACJ. We produced a draft regional decarbonization framework that provides science-based pathways to reduce planet heating gases in the region, and examined workforce development opportunities from climate-related investments in the future. The roadmap for the Office of Environmental and Climate Justice was created in close partnership with community stakeholders that have been working with us and particularly that have identified the unjust burdens of the past 
with unhealthy environmental impacts. The board adopted the office's roadmap this February. We also recently introduced a new online educational resource to the public called a story map that lists environmental, health, and social indicators by census tract so that communities can visually see how different environmental drivers, such as the lack of tree canopy and air pollution, are layered on health impacts such as asthma. And we partnered with San Diego Food System Alliance to develop San Diego County Food Vision 2030 that was planted by the county's state of the food system report in order to improve and nourish the regional food system. OSCJ will have both a regional as well as county specific role and responsibility. As part of its regional role, the office would begin closer collaboration with regional agencies, cities, tribes, business, labor, environmental advocates, and the community to get us to zero carbon emission solutions. We will partner with community-based organizations to gain the trust and involvement of more residents to build com sustainable communities together. OACJ will con convene regional leaders in an EJ working group to find creative cross-jurisdictional solutions as well as to educate decision-making bodies about EJ issues throughout the region. It will develop a roadmap for improved interaction and collaboration with our tribal governments and collaborate on implementing San Diego County Food Vision 2030. As part of its county-specific role, OACJ will serve as a liaison and advocate for unincorporated area residents on EJ issues. The new office will also convene a steering committee, which will include representation from all group executive office departments and to keep the momentum going for sustainability-related initiatives and communication across the county organization. The Sustainability Steering Committee members will be responsible for championing our organizational goals, communicating new initiatives, and tracking progress within our groups in conjunction with departmental liaisons. OACJ will provide guidance on sustainability impact statements that will be included in all board letters beginning with this new fiscal year. These are similar to the equity impact statements that we have been including in the last year. Sustainability impact statements will ensure that there is an alignment of all board actions with the county's strategic initiatives, such as in the areas of environmental justice, climate, and community engagement. OACJ's work aligns with sustainability, equity, and community tenets of the strategic plan. As we continue to address sustainability and EJ issues in our community and as an organization, the establishment of this office will serve the community by providing the tools, funding, and means of communication for meaningful engagement, as well as to tap into the enormous talents, knowledge, and expertise of our county and enterprise to become more sustainable and equitable. We look forward to fully engaging this new office to address problems in our underserved communities, such as air pollution, toxic hotspots, greenhouse gases, emissions, pockets of heat in certain neighborhoods, especially during extreme heat events, substandard housing, lack of transportation options, poor infrastructure such as broadband and connectivity, and a historic deficiency in open space and recreational amenities. OACJ also aligns with the Empower and Justice initiatives of the strategic plan. Throughout our outreach in the last year, we have heard values such as empowerment and justice expressed by our communities, which is why the founding principle of this office is to address past and present injustices and to ensure that these injustices do not occur in the future. We acknowledge the actual implementation of these values will need a continuous and intentional effort. And with strong institutional support of the county, we can take a leadership role in the region. The recommended funding for this office will be $3.6 million. There are 11 positions in this office consisting of five existing and six new posi recommended positions. 
The five existing positions include the tribal liaison, the food system systems coordinator, and three positions budgeted in the Office of Environmental and Climate Justice, which includes the Chief Sustainability Officer. In addition, there will be team members who will serve as sustainability and EJ liaisons that coordinate the office's efforts with the county's four business groups. And there will be support for seeking and administering federal, state, and private grant funding for the region, as well as for disadvantaged, unincorporated communities. From educating our counterparts to holistic looking, looking at a way to reorganization, OSEJ will help the county take thoughtful steps towards aligning our social, economic, health, and environmental efforts to achieving our county's vision for a just, sustainable, and resilient future for all. This concludes the OSEJ presentation. We're available to answer questions. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Um, it's just, first of all, thank you for the um, thoughtful work and uh, really trying to figure out how to uh, restructure operations to align with, um, you know, the board's new priorities around sustainability. I know uh, Supervisor Mark Vargas and myself have repeated this over and over again yesterday that uh, we can't expect you all to do work if you're not staffed appropriately. Um, so just appreciate that uh, you're focused on that in, in luge and, and making sure you are staffed appropriately. Uh, just a question um, to better understand, obviously this Office of Environmental Justice and Sustainability is meant to have a cross-cutting application throughout the enterprise um, in terms of driving our sustainability agenda, but it's in luge. So what is the strategy to ensure uh, kind of accountability to be able to sort of move, move folks um, that are not uh, within luge on, along these lines? Supervisor Lawson Reamer, this operational budget includes um, the implementation of short term goals. We, the departments had presented short, mid, and long term goals earlier this year. Going forward, OSEJ will have liaisons for each of the four business groups that will work with the departments provide technical support in order for them to implement their midterm and long-term goals on sustainability. Okay, thank you. Thank can I, you. Can okay. I just add, Please. jump onto that for a second? I think it's really important that, um, that everybody understand that this is a top-down um, commitment. So every single person that reports to me understands how important sustainability is, where it fits into the framework for the future, and how it it isn't just about luge kinds of sustainability efforts that they've been doing over the last several years. It's much broader than that. It's sustainability for housing. It's sustainability for our economic um, situation. It's, it's all of that, and it touches every single group. So um, every single GM has that as a priority. You saw it yesterday. Every single department has that, and they have specific goals. And we're also bringing it from the, um, the ground up also and engaging our employees to see what can we do? We have our consultant out there meeting with those employee teams, and we've gotten some great ideas. We've shared some of that. We've got more coming. Um, and so this is an enterprise-wide initiative. It's just housing organizationally in luge. Thank you. Vice Chair Vargas. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for that question. And um, with this, I, I really appreciate all the work that's been done on this. I mean, this is... Um, I just am really excited about the work ahead. And I'm gonna ask you the equity question, but I think um, to Supervisor Lawson Weimer's um, question, I mean, in addition to the sustainability, I wanna make sure that the equity piece is part of it, right? Environmental justice is so such an important component of, of, of the work that we're doing, and it really does, it is part of the whole enterprise. And so um, how did you use uh, the equity um, budget tool to be able to put this together and um, challenges or recommendations or anything else uh, that you could provide uh, would be really helpful for me. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Vargas. With the um, direction and leadership of the board, this office was, the Office of Environmental and Climate Justice was founded on the principle of equity and justice. Um, looking, as we did outreach to um, more than 70 community-based organizations around the region, we heard that 
the community wanted to self-identify their needs. As much as we want the community to trust us, the community wants us to trust them. So we're looking forward as uh, this new office gets stood up to partner with the Office of, Envir of Equity and Racial Justice that is leading the budget equity tool to ensure that we operationalized some of those asks that we're hearing from the community. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Chair. Um, this question basically is on the, I guess, in the, for Luge, uh, for the, part of the overall, so I forgot. I uh, didn't jump in quick enough. But I had a question on slide 17. And I don't know if this is more for Helen or more for uh, the Luge Department. But let's see if you can pull that up. On the, um, it, there's a large, I guess, I don't know if it's a disparity, but there's a large delta between, and I'm looking at parks and recreation and public works. This is primarily for the unincorporated area where we are the government for the unincorporated area and, and we are their parks and rec, we are their public works, we are their streets or roads or infrastructure. I just noticed there's, between the recommendation between the staff, and I'm looking at, you know, the 22, 23, uh, column, the recommendation with the staff is 285 million, and the recommended is 69 million, and then for public works, recommendation 610, and then almost half of the budget 341. To me, those, those seems like, like big splits or big gaps, and I'm just wondering, you know, since we're, we, we need to still take care of those, um, those areas and, and their public works and infrastructure and the parks and rec, why the, why the big delta between the ask and, the, uh, and what's being budgeted? Supervisor Desmond, as is, is we're looking at the budget, so uh, in this slide, as we're looking at the general fund and the non-general fund, uh, we have various funding sources for purposes of the Department of Public Works. So as we're looking at the budget, um, and I'm looking up there, so let's start with the public work side. With the 570 staff, I think that you were pointing to. Oh, those so staff, and, not dollars? That's right. Oh, yes. okay. Yes, and then we're going to 610 oh, right. FTE. You scared me there. Okay. <laughs> we, are, we are growing in, in both of those departments, please rest assured, as it relates to, um, as we're seeing the anticipated workload, as we're seeing the new parks coming online. So it, it's just the difference okay. of the I staffing. apologize. It's the that's first time. Okay. I saw this thing. So Not a problem. I, uh, it doesn't sink in it uh, right away, but all right. Well, good. Scared me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentation. And we'll go to our next group. Good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. I'm Davia Lynch, Director of Planning and Development Services, or PDS. Today, I'm pleased to present information on our recommended operational plan and how it will help achieve the board's policy goals and serve our communities. PDS is the lead on the land planning and development process. Collaborating with communities and stakeholders all along the way, we create long-range plans that guide future sustainable development in the unincorporated county. We also review privately initiated land development projects, ranging from roof-mounted solar on a single home to larger subdivision, where we work with stakeholders to review everything from roads to architecture to open space. Last year, we issued 18,000 building permits, conducted 40,000 construction inspections, and closed 2,500 code cases, ensuring our communities remain safe and livable while protecting the environment. In the current fiscal year, some of the department's major accomplishments include combating climate change, supporting safe and sustainable housing, expanding communication, improving the quality of life for residents of San Diego, and partnerships with our stakeholders. To address climate change, we continue to implement measures to protect and promote our natural resources while reducing over 180,000 metric tons of greenhouse gases in calendar year 2021. We introduced a website offering educational resources related to electric vehicles, including information such as what type of EV is best for your budget and lifestyle, where to find vehicles, calculators to provide an estimate of the cost of owning an EV, as well as where to find financial resources and charging stations throughout the county. This site's been visited nearly 8,000 times since it went live in July of 2021. Additionally, we preserved 570 acres of agricultural land by purchasing agricultural easements from willing farmers. 
To support safe and sustainable housing, our team brought three general plan amendments forward to ensure that housing, safety, and environmental justice policies were addressed comprehensively in the county's general plan. We waived plan check, permit, and impact fees for over 400 accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, uh, over the past year, saving customers over $2.8 million. Our pre-approved plans for ADUs even went viral on TikTok. We reduced time and cost for permitting private projects by creating user-friendly guidelines and more options for preparing engineering studies. And we permitted roughly 1,600 new homes in the unincorporated area. To enhance community engagement, we sent all project notices in every threshold language and provided live interpretation services at community meetings as part of our commitment to inclusivity. We translated some of our most frequently accessed applications and documents and made them available online. We met people where they are, including workshops in communities at times when residents could attend and smaller one-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings. Our team also conducted community needs assessments to improve services for underserved communities from graffiti removal to improving public access to electric vehicle chargers. To improve the quality of life for our residents, our team hosted Opportunity Youth in a Career Readiness Program focused on green jobs, where our team members provided mentorship and coaching and shared experiences with these youth where they learned about civic engagement, long range and sustainability planning and development. As we look ahead, we're focused on various initiatives that will make our communities more sustainable, just and equitable. Our recommended budget includes resources at the level shown on, on this slide to support each of our programs and ensure evidence-based, data-driven decision-making, as well as policy analysis, community assessment, and engagement. We'll continue to disaggregate and analyze our data to tailor our programs to the communities we serve. In alignment with the regional decarbonization framework, we continue to move the Climate Action Plan update forward, engaging stakeholders over much of this year to understand the best ways to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions, while prioritizing equity in our communities. We will lead the way with the implementation of the environmental justice element to reduce the exposure and harm of environmental impacts to marginalized and underserved communities. Our conservation ex experts will continue to develop the North County Multiple Species Conservation Program, which plans for landscape level conservation that's critical to protecting the county's most sensitive plants and animals and providing certainty for new development. Our team, in collaboration with other departments, is also re researching and evaluating seven transformative housing solutions. These include policies that can reduce the cost of new construction, especially low and moderate income housing and green buildings. We'll also create new guidelines for how we analyze vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, for development projects in the unincorporated area, which will identify where new development should be located to reduce vehicle, mile tra vehicle miles traveled and associated greenhouse gas emissions. And we're staying focused on meeting housing needs within these new guidelines Starting this year, the new VMT guidelines will streamline opportunities for approximately 5,000 homes to move forward in more urbanized areas closer to transit. We're also working with SANDAG and local cities and transit agencies to create regional VMT mitigation tools for some development outside of these areas. In a related effort, we're also preparing options for a sustainable land use approach for the unincorporated area to help bring together and balance different laws and initiatives, such as those related to VMT, the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, the SANDAG Regional Plan, and the County's Decarbonization Framework and Climate Action Plan. This land use policy framework will help align these efforts and implement them in a way that facilitates urban development and allows our more rural communities to thrive. PDS is also part of the county team developing a socially equitable cannabis program. One of our roles is to support enforcement against unpermitted, unlicensed cannabis facilities. Starting this summer, we'll also be leading the environmental impact report, which will address the environmental impacts of the program and streamline future cannabis-related applications. We're also committed to ongoing innovation and streamlining to reduce permit processing times and costs while maintaining thorough and, and accurate project review. We continue to expand online services and will keep moving towards reviewing building and grading plans electronically as part of a larger enterprise effort. We'll continue to focus on supporting our staff through workforce development initiatives and training. We'll also continue the training and team building efforts related to justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. We'll continue to embrace long-term teleworking and alternate work schedules. Our metrics show that by teleworking, our PDS County employees avoided 1.3 million miles of driving since 2020. 
This eliminated tailpipe emissions equal to the amount of electricity needed to power 75 homes in one year. Lastly, we are committed to maintaining fiscal stability and will be monitoring potential grant opportunities, such as the federal bipartisan infrastructure law, for opportunities to proactively identify projects and funding available to enhance public and environmental health programs. We would leverage these funds, along with the more than $1 million in grants we were awarded over the past fiscal year for sustainability programs. All of our efforts align with the county's strategic plan. To further sustainability, we're including roughly $13 million to limit the impacts of climate change by using data-driven, evidence-based methods to plan for growth that will be sustainable for generations to come. In addition to continuing programs mentioned previously, our team will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels by, by converting our department fleet to hybrid electric vehicles and increasing telecommuting opportunities while ensuring that customer service remains a priority. We're working with our partners in general services to perform detailed office space analysis, given the increases in teleworking, to identify where we may be able to reduce our space and energy needs. We'll build on existing tree planting efforts and develop an expanded tree canopy program on public and private lands in the unincorporated area to naturally cool public spaces and buildings, reducing energy use and sequestering greenhouse gases. We'll focus on increasing tree coverage in environmental justice communities and other communities that have fewer trees today. In addition, PDS, Parks and the County Library will work together with stakeholders to identify where we can plant more trees at and around libraries so that community members have more shade when walking or biking to the library or can even enjoy a book outdoors. We'll support our communities and the region in the transition to more clean energy use by offering one-day electric vehicle charger permits and continuing fee waiver programs for photo residential rooftop solar photovoltaic systems, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by over 24,000 metric tons which is equivalent to removing over 5,000 gas-powered vehicles from the road for one year. PDS is recommending over $11 million toward equity initiatives in our operational plan. This funding will be used to remove barriers to housing production and create a more fair and equitable land use code. Fee waivers, buy right development policies which would allow for streamlined and reduced development costs without the need for discretionary permitting, and, processing, and process improvements to reduce the time and cost for county review of private projects without sacrificing quality. We'll work on updates to the safety and housing elements of the general plan and modernize land use regulations to make them more equitable and transparent for all users. We'll also increase funding to our code compliance programs to ensure timely response to code violations, improving health, safety, and sustainability in our communities at the same time focusing on education and collaboration related to code compliance, ensuring a fair and equitable approach to re resolving violations. We'll work with our county and regional partners to address broadband and connectivity access as we continue to investigate possible funding opportunities and projects that could help expand broadband service in the unincorporated area. We're also including $1.5 million for empowering our workforce, including training employees on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion and belonging, and developing coaching, mentoring, and technical trainings in various disciplines. We'll continue to participate in programs that provide career development and internship opportunities to youth from underserved communities. To empower our residents and customers, our team is disaggregating community and customer data to align our programs and our people with the communities we serve. Additionally, staff will look to update land use regulations based not only on state requirements and the board's direction, but we will also increase our monitoring of industry best practices and use data in new ways so that our policy recommendations are innovative and responsive to the community. To support the community, PDS is including almost $24 million in our recommended operational plan. This is for our review and inspection of privately initiated land development projects to ensure safe, sustainable, and equitable design and construction. We're also expanding our community outreach, as I described earlier, including translation services and meeting with communities in places and ways that work for them. We have several community planning and sponsor groups that use county libraries to conduct meetings in their communities in spaces that are safe and accessible to all. Lastly, we'll continue to make our hearings accessible for everyone by continuing to hold planning commission meetings in a hybrid in-person format, uh, hybrid virtual and in-person format, and sending hearing notices in all threshold languages, and advertising upcoming hearings in multilingual publications to allow fair and equitable access to the decision-making process by our many diverse stakeholders. 
Our recommended operational plan also includes several key performance indicators for next year. These measures demonstrate our accountability to priorities like supporting housing production, agriculture, and clean, sustainable communities. We estimate that we'll review at least 15,000 building plans next year, including for at least 700 new homes, ensuring structures in the unincorporated area are safe and green. To further sustainability, we'll secure over 400 acres of farmland in our Purchase of Agricultural Conservation Easements Program and resolve 70% of debris and solid waste complaints within six months. In fiscal year 2022-23, we are recommending a department budget of $51.1 million, an increase of $0.6 million from last fiscal year, which we'll review in more detail in the next slide. The increased budget is due to 35 new staff, which is about a 15% increase in the total department staffing. We were able to contain some of these costs by reducing services and supply expenses and implementing cost-saving initiatives of roughly $1.8 million annually. The proposed PDS budget is projected to be funded by approximately 54% revenue offset, sources like fees and grants, and 46% general purpose revenue, which is consistent with the historic norm of roughly a half and half split between these funding sources. When determining our proposed staffing levels, we considered existing board direction on various efforts, as well as state mandates and other requirements that we'll need to meet. We also closely evaluated our permit volume, workload, and revenue impacts to estimate what staffing levels are appropriate to support projected development activity. Of those 35 recommended new positions, 30 new positions are being requested to support housing, sustainability, improved quality of life and community safety, as well as policy, outreach, and data-driven decision-making. We're also proposing to use almost $14 million in one-time general purpose revenue for plans and programs, including those that I described today. This completes the update for planning and development services, and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if we have any questions. Vice Chair Vargas. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Vargas. Um, equity is an under underpinning of everything we do, so we're looking at that throughout the process um, in every effort. We found the equity assessment tool to be a really valuable check and balance. It's a checkpoint in that process where we can stop and, and remind ourselves to say, who are we serving? Ask who we're serving, what does the data say, um, how are we accomplishing that, and what are, for example, the unintended consequences to those underserved populations? Um, I think a, a valuable example of that is our community needs assessments. One of those that we performed had to do with solar photovoltaics, PVs. And we asked, who are we serving? Who's getting these permits? What, uh, what, do those, uh, what does that population look like? And we did find that there was a higher number of solar PVs being installed on, on personal homes in non-underserved communities than underserved communities. I think there are a variety of factors there as we start to look at the data, like home ownership, financial barriers. But it gave us the opportunity to look at that disparity and say, what, what can we do? So we're currently in dialogue with uh, solar providers on the private side, along with our stakeholders, to talk about what type of financing incentives might be more accessible out there, what types of other tools might we be able to move forward with, an example being the accessory dwelling unit pre-approved plans that the board uh, directed us to do that have been very successful. Perhaps there's an option to do that with solar. Uh, so we're looking at a variety of options. Um, and I think the equity assessment tool was a really helpful uh, step in that process to ask those questions. I think the uh, the work your department has to do ahead of you is is some of the most important we're doing as it relates to housing in particular, um, getting the climate action plan in place, getting VMT established in a workable way, um, working through the transition from LOS to VMT, um, figuring out the mitigation bank, I mean, all of the various components, because I think as a board, we want to build housing. Uh, we want to build it where it's most appropriate, and we want to build it affordably. We also know we have considerable work to do on the affordable side in that very low area. And so do you have all the tools and resources you need to help us as expeditiously as possible implement all those changes so we can have some certainty around um, the housing side of our, our land use component? Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, we have a lot of the tools that have already proven to be very successful. I mentioned the ADU waivers. Mm -hmm. um, we've nearly tripled the number of accessory dwelling units that we've seen in the past three, three years, beginning with those waivers and some of the pre-approved plans that can save you know, 
10%, up to $25,000 of, of the cost of a, an ADU. <coughs> so tools like that and then the 60 programs that we've been directed to pursue and have been funded for as part of the housing element that the board adopted last year, those tools such as buy right programs and others um, will help us to get there. Um, and we are implementing 21 of those today, right. and we have about 39 left. So we're well on our way um, and have ongoing direction and funding to do that. Um, I think that one of the other valuable tools that will be helpful to examine as we move forward is the recent direction from the board to explore a parcel by parcel analysis. Mm -hmm. um, through that effort, if we're directed to continue that and, and uh, resourced appropriately, that effort will really help us to understand what is the true development potential in the county and what other tools might be needed, mm -hmm. um, perhaps that the, this, the county can support to help facilitate that development in key areas in a very specific and tailored fashion. Okay. But you have enough staff and resources at this point to be able to implement all the things that are underway? Yes, Chair, we did ask for those positions um, in the fiscal year 22-23 budget and we'll fill them as the board direction comes forward. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, random question, I know we've got um, some canopy uh, tree money in there. Where where are we targeting that? What, what areas? Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, we are currently initiating the, the initial steps in a tree canopy assessment to identify where the gaps are. Um, what are those communities that have less tree coverage today? Um, we do have a position identified in this uh, budget if approved. Uh, that will be essentially an urban forester forester position that will help work with geographic information systems and other uh, departments such as our, our colleagues here at Parks to identify where those gaps are. So we will return to the board and identify uh, where those locations are and where that funding would be directed. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any other requests, we'll go to our next presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. I'm Jeff Monetta, your Director of Public Works. Today we are pleased to present our recommended operational plan. DPW is committed to providing reliable and sustainable infrastructure for our unincorporated community. During this year, our field crews continue to maintain approximately 2,000 miles of road infrastructure, including water, sewer, landfills, and airports. Our eight county airports supported over a half million flights and served as operating bases for Sheriff Astria, Cal Fire, and the U.S. Forest Service. We manage special districts that provide funding for wastewater and water services to more than 36,000 customers, flood control facilities, street lights, and private road maintenance and landscaping. Our team continue to maintain environmental compliance for 21 closed landfills, implemented programs to improve water quality, and increased waste diversion to meet state and local mandates. DPW is focused on addressing our critical infrastructure needs and programs that support a more sustainable community. We developed, designed, and built projects that promote economic prosperity and enhance road safety, added new sidewalks and traffic signals, improved drainage and water quality, upgraded aging water and wastewater facilities, and improved our airports. County Airports crafted a responsive and forward-looking master plan for the Palomar Airport in partnership with the community and airport users. We are now working to develop sustainability plans for each of our eight, eight county airports to make our operations more green and sustainable through facility management, maintenance, improvement, and innovation. Through our annual road resurfacing plan, we continue to improve the publicly maintained road system throughout the unincorporated county. We use a measure called Pavement Condition Index, or PCI, which is an average condition rating across all public roads. A rating at or above 70 is considered a very good condition. Currently, our roads have a PCI of 66, and we are well on our way to achieving a PCI of 70 by year 2025. We developed a departmental sustainability plan that includes items such as electrification of our fleet to align with the regional decarbonization framework. Our Green Streets Clean Water Plan identifies 30 high priority projects that could be implemented within the roadway right of way to filter urban runoff and remove pollution before it enters the storm drain and impacts our local water bodies. This improves water quality for beachgoers and waterways downstream. 
Projects are prioritized based on their potential for pollution reduction and social benefits such as sidewalks, bike lanes, and addition of green space within underserved communities as well as project cost. In addition, we hosted an opportunity for youth in a career readiness program that focused on green jobs, where our tremendous team members provided mentorship and coaching in order to provide an experience for these youth to learn about civic engagement and to research the impacts of climate change. We continue to use an equity-based approach to proactively monitor closed landfills and make repairs as needed to protect the health and safety of the surrounding communities. Our revenues remain steady this year and were higher than anticipated for our road program. As a result, you will see a proposed budget next fiscal year that includes $108 million for infrastructure improvements to roads, airports, and wastewater and water infrastructure. This includes $60 million to repave roads, which includes repair of aging drainage structures and upgrades to sidewalks with ADA curb ramps to enhance access and walkability. The proactive repair of our road infrastructure will reduce future costs. $18.9 million is included specifically for our road crews who work in extreme weather conditions and seasons to maintain our roads and other infrastructure to keep the community safe, which includes snow plowing, pothole repairs, and storm preparation. DPW will invest $24.9 million to increase sustainability, including $9 million for water quality improvements, outreach, and sewer line replacements, and $10 million to divert waste from landfills and maintain closed landfills. We are committed to maintaining fiscal stability and will monitor potential grant opportunities such as federal bipartisan infrastructure law grants to proactively identify projects and funding available to enhance public and environmental health programs. $2.8 million is proposed for empowering the community through increased stakeholder outreach and leveraging data to track community needs. DPW's recommended budget includes investments to, to support each of our programs and provide for data-driven decision-making, evidence-based policy analysis, and com community assessment and, and engagement to seek feedback and evaluation of data so we can make decisions in our programs for the communities we serve. Staff will lead existing efforts in the areas of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging by expanding workforce education. Our programs are inclusive and equitable services, and these principles are incorporated in our workforce training. We will also continue to focus on supporting our staff through workforce development initiatives and training by finding opportunities to conduct training in a cost-effective manner to maximize the number of employees participating. In addition, we will promote cross-training for our team members for better succession planning. We will also continue to embrace long-term teleworking and alternate work schedules. Our metrics also show that by teleworking, our DPW County employees avoided 1.8 million miles of driving since 2020. This eliminated tailpipe emissions equal to the amount of electricity needed to power 104 homes in one year. By incorporating climate action plan measures and infrastructure improvements, we will take actions that protect the environment. This includes reducing pollution in waterways, the need for new landfills and greenhouse gas emissions. We are committed to diverting waste from landfills to meet a waste diversion goal of 75% by 2025 and 80% by 2030. And we are implementing requirements to divert organic materials to help get there. We will actively address climate change by providing new infrastructure that supports alternative modes of transportation, such as new sidewalks and bike lanes, and resurface existing county-maintained roads to improve rideability. We are in the process of developing airport sustainability plans that will be standalone programs that are coordinated and complementary to the Climate Action Plan and Regional Decarbonization Framework. DPW applies an equitable lens to provide, provide opportunities for underserved communities. We will continue to utilize the Integrated Regional Water Management Program to bring additional state resources 
to underserved communities for water resources projects, such as projects that capture trash before it enters local water. We will continue to support implementation of the Working Family Ordinance by ensuring contractors and lessees comply with specific requirements related to workforce qualifications, employee leave, and employee protections. DPW empowers the community by utilizing assessment methods, including data from the local road safety plan and pedestrian gap analysis to identify community needs to better serve our diverse customers. We will continue our commitment to increased awareness and inclusivity by increasing translation of information and providing training opportunities to staff. We will continue to support community engagement by providing information, programs, public forums, or other avenues that increase access for people to provide input to impact change, including but not limited to coordination with community planning and sponsor groups, advisory groups, and the public during public project planning, prioritization, and implementation. Translated outreach materials and translation services will continue to be offered in public forums to increase engagement. We will support community emergency preparedness through staff training and improvements to the hazard alert systems. For example, the alert flood warning system. And we will enhance the community by maintaining our infrastructure in good condition, providing reliability and reducing impacts, enhance health and safety and increase access, including improving accessibility for individuals with disabilities. We are developing comprehensive plans and currently have them for road resurfacing, pedestrian gap analysis, traffic signals and bike facilities. However, we are working on plans where we don't have them and they are for flood control, guardrails and culverts. In order to proactively maintain infrastructure and plan for future budget needs for long-term sustainability. DPW will continue efforts to expand outreach to communities and local organizations to increase stakeholder involvement in the planning and implementation of various public works projects. Specifically, we will continue to engage with the community through the South County Environmental Justice Task Force to plan and implement projects that address cross-border flows of trash and sewage that disproportionately impact South Bay communities. For example, we are assisting DPR, Parks and Rec, through design oversight for the Smuggler's Gulch Improvements Project, which will implement additional sediment and trash capture features to reduce local flooding and improve downstream water quality. Our key performance measures gauge our program's benefits while focusing on operational effectiveness, cost containment, and continuous improvements. Although we will require time to reach our goal to reduce 100% of urban runoff, we also track how, our, how much bacteria from sewage pollution is coming from our storm drains. This helps us prioritize specific storm drains and drainage areas to monitor and eliminate high-risk pollution from sewage. Water quality testing in our storm drains during dry weather has shown that 98% of county alt falls are free of this bacteria. Sewer spills are a significant health and safety concern. We are continuing our annual maintenance plan that includes cleaning and video inspections to prevent blockages and reduce sewer spills. We are also making investments in replacing and rehabilitating our aging sewer lines. For our airports program, we use outcome-based metrics to provide routine and preventative maintenance and reduce the amount of time our runway is closed. We strive to keep our airport runways open and available for public and business and emergency uses. We have had a success rate of 95% runway availability to promote economic vitality and emergency use. For our road resurfacing program in the five years since Senate Bill 1 was approved to invest state gas tax revenues in improving roads, freeways, and bridges across the state, Public Works has resurfaced more than 520 miles of unincorporated roads, with more in construction now. This effort has led to an increase in the Pavement Condition Index, or PCI, to 66, and our goal for next year is 68. 
The budget proposes to spend $60 million next fiscal year. We are moving toward the goal of a PCI of 70 and expect to achieve it in year 2025. DPW is a combination of general fund and non-general fund programs for a total recommended budget of $341.4 million. Our total recommended budget for general fund activities is $22.6 million, which mainly supports the stormwater management program, private development construction projects, and the county's cleanup and sanitation program, and includes one-time funding for stormwater projects, new sidewalks and bike lanes to support reduction in greenhouse gases, and projects to maintain safe and reliable drinking water supplies for underserved communities. The $21.8 million decrease shown for next year would actually be closer to a $5.8 million increase, or almost a 13% increase. $27.6 million for one-time funding that supports DPW projects such as sidewalks, bike lanes, and stormwater management is accounted for in other areas of the budget. Our general fund programs are funded by 59% general purpose revenue and 41% revenues from fees and grants. In fiscal year 21-22, the county spent approximately $50 million on stormwater compliance related activities throughout the enterprise. In fiscal year 22-23, we expect the countywide investment to expand to approximately $65 million, increasing to over $100 million by fiscal year 25-26. While these are significant stormwater investments, they are not sufficient to eliminate stormwater-related compliance risks. Stormwater compliance is difficult from a technical and cost perspective. This is largely because the sources of stormwater pollution are extensive and spread across large areas, and the fact that stormwater runoff is largely untreated. Currently, approximately 5% of st all stormwater runoff in the unincorporated county receives treatment before being discharged to local waterways. To increase stormwater treatment and improve water quality, thereby decreasing the compliance risks, it is estimated that the current investment of approximately $50 million per year would need a double to $100 million per year. Next fiscal year, DPW is recommending additional resources for our stormwater program to support green infrastructure capital projects, which will improve water quality. To enhance our ability to better serve our diverse population and ensure services are provided equitably, we are recommending a new section of staff who will collect and utilize data and community outreach to institute a department-wide approach to prioritizing projects and engaging stakeholders. Staff will assist the various programs in DPW to conduct community outreach for the, priority, uh, for the project priority list development and as the projects come to fruition. DPW's non, uh, recommended non-general fund budget is $318 million and primarily supports the road program, airport, sanitation and water districts, recycling and closed landfills and special districts. The projects shown as decreases on the slide are due to the completion of one-time funding for one-time projects, such as adding almost 2,000 feet of new sidewalk in Lincoln Acres, Lakeside and Fallbrook, and a project to strengthen the Willows Road Bridge in Alpine. We are highlighting the road program, which is our largest budget, and we are proposing an increase of $18.5 million for new projects and an, an expanded road resurfacing program that is funded by program revenue, including leveraging the use of available road fund fund balance. This table shows our non-general fund budget changes. Next fiscal year, we are recommending 30 new positions which will support our airports, recycling, and roads program. This concludes our presentation and we are available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for that presentation, all the work that you're doing, I mean, particularly around, obviously, um, the Tijuana River Valley and then also uh, the focus to enhance safety and accessibility and walkability um, in county roads and infrastructure has been really a top priority for all of you, so I really appreciate that. 
Um, I was really interested in the um, data that you provided around teleworking, and I'm really interested, um, um, Helen, if we can really monitor that because what we keep hearing uh, from folks, um, and because I serve on the um, San Diego Economic Development Corporation as um, the county's representative, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about the work shortage. And so I'm trying to look at different ways of like the new way we're gonna be doing work, right? The nine to five is not working for a lot of people anymore. There's a lot of new trends. And so I think if we can really think about what is what what are we learning from this, right? Um, team morale, communication, is it working? You know, we still achieving our goals. Um, it could be a great model for us, and particularly around sustainability. So it, it, it just it just kind of um, seems like it's something that would be really um, something good for us to continue to monitor as we're moving forward. So congratulations on the great work and also uh, on that. But um, in addition to that, I wanted to ask you uh, specifically on the equity tool and how um, you all used it uh, in your process and, and any feedback that you may have for me on it. Sure, uh, thank you for the question, Vice Chair Vargas. Um, we, we utilize the budget equity tool to com complement the community needs assessment in what we were already doing in our programs. And what we determined was that the data showed that 60% of our county unincorporated publicly maintained road inventory is actually in underserved communities. The second part that we used the tool was for, uh, to gauge our community outreach practices. And we utilized dem demographic data because we wanna make sure that we determine if the outreach materials and education materials that we're providing to the communities meet the community's needs. So if, if we feel that uh, based on that data, we need to increase or provide different types of materials for that education, then we'll go ahead and ramp up and provide those different materials. In addition for our closed landfills and from an equity lens, we are looking at the prioritization of cleanup and the potential reuse locations, including underserved communities as we evaluate the prioritization. Um, one of the challenges that we faced as a result of the tool was that we, we found that we need to increase state mandated recycling requirement. You know, we have increased state mandated recycling requirements. And an area that uh, we found that we need to focus on is on the multifamily dwelling units. So apartments and condos, for example. And uh, so these are areas where we can improve our education um, as well as implementing additional measures to meet that, those state mandated requirements. The, there may be some increased costs, however, um, due to adding any necessary recycling bins or trash enclosures. So if the facilities such as condos or uh, apartments and this has been my experience in the past from other agencies where those requirements may require diversion, um, organic waste, for example, those type of receptacles, then these facilities may need to invest in some of these facilities to accommodate these programs. Uh, this may cause an increase um, in Passover to rents or HOA fees. So we will be working to partner with these communities in order to find a way that meets our state requirements while also trying to minimize the costs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanna go back to your telework question um, just briefly. Um, first of all, I wanna recognize Jennifer Lawson. She's out in the, uh, in the audience. Jennifer, wave your hand. She's the chief operating officer for Luge, but she also <coughs> took on the special project of helping the whole enterprise go to a teleworking model during COVID. And she put together a great team and has done remarkable things. And we have identified areas where this has been incredibly productive. So we're working on those measurements. That is one of, uh, one of the goals of the team. Um, we met the other day with um, our audits team. Uh, they're going in now and taking that next phase of auditing the teleworking results and being able to put that into incorporated our report so that we can show the success that we have had uh, with it, but also you know, making sure that there isn't any waste in that, um, in that model. We don't believe there is, but we always wanna, wanna check for that. So we're really pleased with that. Uh, we've also been putting the goals into um, each department, not just on the teleworking goals, but also in what are you saving? What are you saving in GHD, but what are you saving in space so that we can convert that? And that's one of our big exercises, as you know, on the COC property, 
we want to try to empty out a facility so that rather than building a new public health administration building for $200 million, we can turn around and take one of our existing uh, uh, infrastructure footprints there and, and move folks there and save the money to be reinvested elsewhere. So it's really important. It's been very successful for the county. We're really proud of that. And we are taking it to that next level and uh, we're happy to give a report back to the board at any time on that. And then I think it can be used as a model for what you're doing and what you're leading in other parts of the state. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and board members. Thanks for the opportunity to provide an overview of the recommended operational plan for Parks and Recreation. Our vision is a Parks and Recreation system that is the pride of San Diego County, both county government and for our region's residents. We conserve our region's natural resources and sustain our biodiversity. We provide world-class recreation experiences for our customers. We create places for communities to connect and stay healthy. And we're continuing to grow our parks network and build new facilities to help us achieve greater park equity throughout the county. Your county park system features 156 parks and facilities, 384 miles of trails and over 56,000 acres of parkland. For comparison of what that is in terms of geographic size, 17 of the 18 cities in San Diego County are smaller than your county park system. We offer programs or facilities in all of the county's cities, as well as the unincorporated area. It's been a year of growth for parks. Our design and construction team is implementing an ambitious $91 million program this year with 21 completed projects to date. Our capital program includes our Excellence and Accessibility ADA Transition Plan, which is helping us provide access for all. This year, it included accessibility improvements to parking pathways and restrooms at two of our regional parks. Our trail system provides an opportunity for people of all ages to engage in physical activity through walking or jogging, bike riding, and horse riding, and also to connect with nature. This year, we added four miles of new recreational trails, increasing the total trail system to 384 miles. DPR's conservation program is thriving. We monitor wildlife and steward resources at 71 preserves, including two new ones this year and 825 acres added to sustain our county as one of North America's biodiversity hotspots. A species that is enjoying great success is Lakeside Theonosis, a medium-sized shrub found only in Southern California and the Northern Baja Peninsula. It's currently found in four county preserves and its population is increasing in each of those preserves. We've documented a 15% increase of coastal sage scrub habitat at Simon County Preserve, which supports the federally listed California gnat catcher. Our management and monitoring at Ramona Grasslands Preserve shows that multiple raptors, including golden and bald eagles, are successfully nesting and foraging in and around the preserve. And we continue our efforts to enhance water quality in the Tijuana River Valley. This year, we obtained $10 million in State Coastal Conservancy funding to create trash capture and sedimentation basins at Smuggler's Gulch. That project is currently in design and is expected to begin construction in 2023. The heart and soul of what we do has always been our rangers and field team taking great care of our parks so that people can enjoy visiting on their own or participating in one of hundreds of structured programs that we offer. This year, we're expanding our first-time camping and outdoor recreation program, which provides the necessary resources like outdoor gear, instruction, and transportation to help eliminate barriers and expand access for residents to be able to enjoy our great outdoors. We're also introducing a food access opportunity tool that we designed in partnership with Agriculture Weights and Measures that identifies opportunities to address low-income, low-access areas and increase community food production across the county. We'll continue to host Opportunity Youth in a career readiness program that's focused on green jobs and vocational mentorship. And we will sharpen our focus on conservation by expanding species monitoring from 20 preserves to 30 preserves and monitoring 27 MSCP covered species to help showcase the success of our programs in preserving the region's biodiversity. 
Our recommended budget includes staffing to support our strong focus on community engagement and outreach with increasing efforts in data-driven decision-making and evidence-based policy analysis. We use our community needs assessment to fill gaps in services and to address equity throughout the county using data-driven strategies. This guides not only the type of facilities and programs we offer, for example, a desire for more trails, better restrooms, and more opportunities for increasing trends like pickleball. It also helps us assess the relative condition of our facilities in various communities. This year, we will be reviewing our agreements with partner organizations to ensure greater consistency and program quality across geographic areas. Staff will lead existing efforts in the areas of justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and parks will continue to pursue sustainability, climate, and environmental justice. We are also closely monitoring the federal infrastructure law for opportunities and funding. We're optimistic it might provide resources for new trails and bikeways, as well as additional photovoltaics to help us meet our park sustainability goals. We are broadening our analysis of properties for potential acquisitions with a cross-departmental team that will evaluate multiple sustainability perspectives. This coordination will ensure alignment with the county's climate action plan update, water quality protection, and regional decarbonization framework. And we'll continue to support our staff through development opportunities and telework options. Since 2020, by teleworking, our employees avoided over a half million miles of driving. This eliminated tailpipe emissions equivalent to the amount of electricity needed to power 30 homes for a year. DPR's proposed operational plan aligns with each of the county's strategic plan initiatives. Our proposed budget includes $15 million invested in conservation programs including MSCP and our program to improve the tree canopy in parks. We're also continuing the conversion of our vehicle and equipment fleet to cleaner technology and reviewing office spaces to identify where shared space or hubs can be utilized as a result of our increase in teleworking. To promote equitable park access throughout the region, we plan to open 10 new facilities this year, including new trails and recreation amenities. We're also investing an additional $700,000 to expand recreation programs. This includes 100 additional events in our countywide SD Nights program for youth and more programs like Women in the Wild that reduce barriers and provide structured ways for all ages and abilities to enjoy the county's park system. Parks and libraries are natural partners and we continue to work together to improve literacy and expand access to materials. This year, we will pilot an initiative to install comfortable reading areas and self-service pickup lockers in parks for delivery of library materials in areas that are not served by a local library branch. The locker kiosk will provide access to the library's online catalog so that park visitors can request titles from anywhere in the library system or their partner libraries, which is more than 40 million items. We're also going to continue efforts to increase transparency and empower community members to engage in our processes by posting public meeting notes and videos within three days of each event and sharing links on our website and social media channels. This will include a feature that enables translation into the customer's preferred language by Google Translate. Parks help create community and DPR will continue to invest in our communities by providing a robust slate of volunteer opportunities for people to give back and also to meet other people committed to improving their neighborhoods. For many adult caregivers and kids, the best place for a community to come together is on the playground. And our budget for next year includes upgrades to 22 playgrounds. We're also going to add some new locations for our Story Trails program, which tells stories in both English and Spanish on signs along popular trails so people can walk and read their way through our parks. One of the ways that DPR will promote justice is by providing more meaningful public engagement and ensuring equal access to our decision-making process. We plan to create positions on our existing advisory boards for youth participants, and we'll also be expanding our Ranger Mentor Program. DPR's key performance measures are geared to expand our park system, improve the recreational experience of our visitors, and maintain environmental and financial responsibility. We've acquired over 800 acres of new parkland this year, 
exceeding our annual goal of 500 acres. This brings our total to almost 57,000 acres. To maintain the health of our parkland, we manage our tree canopy very actively, ensuring species diversification, no net loss through land development or environmental threats, and growth of our urban forest over time. A healthy and expanding tree canopy provides needed shade, reduces surface temperatures, and cleans the air through greenhouse gas reduction. Since expanding our tree program in 2017, we have planted over 27,000 trees and will continue our ambitious goal to plant at least 3,500 trees annually. Chair Fletcher, you had asked um, how we identify some of those locations and obviously we are trying to maintain the vegetative health in all of our parks and replacing uh, trees that are lost uh, through environmental threats. But we also use the Healthy Places Index, which provides a tree canopy score for each of the communities. And so we've looked at where those community scores are the lowest and identified parks in those communities to expand the tree canopy. We are also going to be growing our volunteer program, which is an integral part of our program delivery. Our volunteer workforce provides the equivalent service of nearly 60 full-time employees and saves the county $2.5 million each year. This snapshot of DPR's staffing and general fund budget shows the vast majority of our positions and our fiscal resources are spent on field operations, providing services directly to residents and visitors. The Park Development, Resource Management, and Administration divisions support these field operations through construction design and oversight, environmental services, fiscal and administrative support. DPR's budget for next year includes an increase of 36 new positions and $8.8 .8 million. 87% of this increase will be funded by GPR while 13% will be supported through increases in program revenues, such as camping and special event fees. The majority of our new positions will be in park operations, but we were also making investments in our conservation programs, new park development, and the support team that helps keep our customers uh, moving, our operations moving, I'm sorry. This includes three positions that will advance cutting edge policies through collaboration, research and monitoring industry trends, and best practices. Roughly 12% of DPR's budget is for non-general fund programs, which are funded primarily by special districts, including county service areas and community facilities districts. Overall, our non-general fund budget is increasing by $300,000 to 7.6 million. The recommended adjustments to DPR's general fund budget will cover the 36 new positions that I mentioned. The park operations positions will be managing new parks and preserves in the county system. The environmental stewardship, administration, and development positions will support our increased focus on conservation efforts, including our MSCP program, and will provide support to complete board-approved park development projects. That completes the Parks and Recreational Operational Plan Overview, and we are available to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the presentation. I think just to reiterate the point you just made, 156 parks, 56,000 areas of parkland in a county park system that is bigger in space than 17 of the 18 uh, incorporated cities in San Diego County. I think it really uh, provides a testament to the county's long-term commitment to, uh, to our park system. Uh, I'm very excited about the Experience Outdoors program, uh, getting new people into the regional parks, uh, getting people to have the opportunity to go out and have an experience camping or hiking uh, or rock climbing or any of the mountain biking. Um, I think that our, our regional parks are such an incredible asset and we've invested so much over so many decades as a county uh, to come in with focused efforts to activate them more and get new people to our regional parks um, and really kind of overcoming the barrier of the unknown. If we can overcome that barrier of the unknown and they can go and have a great experience and it could just be a, a, a picnic in one of our parks. Um, and then realizing, okay, it's actually not that far, it's not that hard to do. Um, you know, I think we can create generations and generations of folks that 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now will be using our regional parks because of the Experience Outdoors program. And so I think that is uh, incredibly exciting um, and uh, getting people out on those 384 miles of trails, uh, which I think is wonderful. So um, a lot of uh, exciting stuff and certainly something we're going to want to be engaged on and, and continue to monitor as we go forward. Uh, let me go uh, quick to Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, sorry. 
a couple of things. I just wanted to say I, I love the idea of the of the lockers, right? As everybody knows, that the little library initiative. I know we're going to be talking about that a little bit later, but uh, I appreciate that um, that the locations. Uh, my understanding is that you're going to be using the Healthy Place Index and three and four to be able to do that, and that you're going to be doing it near public transit areas uh, where there's no libraries around, and so. This is my plea so that in the future there's, uh, District 1 is also uh, targeted as an opportunity for another maybe second pilot program. You know, I got to ask. Um, and then I also want to just applaud the, the work of the department because we've been very, working very closely with you on a couple of the different things. But um, I know that you all have been doing a lot of work to make sure that all of the ground, the, the ground now for all of the parks is uh, decomposed granite, which I think is really important. We've been hearing particularly from the community that it's important that we have that. And we just opened up um, Ilindica Park, right? Um, and it was really important uh, that we have that. And I know that a couple of folks have uh, talked about what that means and making sure that we have shade in all of our structures and our playgrounds and it just it's it's so important so thank you for that and then the last question I have of course is around the the Tijuana River Valley um, since declaring it the a public health care crisis has been a priority I know all of you have been great partners the whole department has I just want to make sure that you have enough staff for all the work that is to come um, I know that we're, we have a lot of ideas and and thoughts and we've had great conversations about where we're moving and, and there's a lot of funding and opportunities that may be coming from, well, we're advocating for a lot of funding from the federal government and the state government, particularly for um, the Tijuana River Valley. And I think that the county has now taken a very um, different role than we've had in the past. And so I just wanna make sure that you have what you need uh, to be able to do the work as we're moving forward. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, you know, in the, in the current year, we added new positions to manage some of the expanded trails in the Tijuana River Valley uh, campground. Um, in this proposed budget for next year, it includes one position that'll be focused on environmental stewardship uh, in the Tijuana River Valley. But as you know, um, we have very ambitious plans, both for improving the water quality um, and cross-border sewage infrastructure, uh, as well as the recreation opportunities. And there's a master plan for the yeah. park. And so as each component moves forward, um, and comes online, uh, we will be back here uh, to your board requesting uh, the resources to take care of it. Okay, and then last but not least, the equity question. Um, I wanted just to ask you, how, how, how was that for you as you were? For parks, the, the budget equity tool was very um, helpful in, in sort of affirming that uh, our equity-based tools like our capital investment model and our community needs assessment are working. Um, I would say, you know, one of the specific areas that we reflected on and are making some improvement next year based specifically on the budget equity tool is uh, the promotional materials and information that we provide, um, and uh, which some of which are very popular, the Trails Passport, for example. And so we're going to be expanding many of those um, into the eight uh, different languages. Um, and that feature will help us communicate um, what we're doing and the value of our programs with a broader audience here in the county. Thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Tim. All right. Environmental health and quality. Good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. I'm Amy Harbert, the director of the Department of Environmental Health Quality, or DEHQ, and thank you for this opportunity to provide an overview of our recommended operational plan. DEHQ enhances public health by preventing disease and promoting responsibility to protect the environment. We implement only fo over 40 different public or environmental health programs that help prevent foodborne illness, vector-borne disease, groundwater contamination, recreational water illness, and accidental chemical releases to the environment. Some of our programs are region-wide, such as our food, hazardous material, vector control, and beach water quality testing programs. Some of our programs are implemented where cities contract us to operate their local programs, such as housing, where we permit and routinely inspect multi-dwelling units for health and safety in 10 cities and the unincorporated area. And some of our programs, such as our septic permitting, are specific to the unincorporated communities. DEHQ works with regulated businesses and the public through education to increase environmental awareness, illness prevention, and regulatory compliance. We implement and conduct enforcement of local, state, and federal environmental laws and enhance the quality of life for residents and visitors. 
On a daily basis, the DEHQ team is out there in all communities across the region conducting more than 70,000 inspections per year. DEHQ's key mandated programs include implementing the California Retail Food Code at more than 15,000 food facilities, including food trucks and 800 temporary events, and focusing on food safety and preventing foodborne illness. We regulate more than 14,000 hazardous material businesses to ensure that hazardous materials and waste are properly managed. Vector Control, which performs surveillance of mosquito treatment at more than 1,600 sites to lower the incidence of vector-borne disease in the region, such as West Nile virus. And we also sample beach water quality for San Diego's 70 miles of coastline. Highlights of DEHQ's accomplishments this year include um, in partnership with Public Health Services becoming the first coastal county in the nation to obtain approval to use the PCR rapid beach water quality testing method. This allows us to provide the public with water quality sample results the very same day that we've collected them. With community design and input, DEHQ is implementing the board authorized two-year micro enterprise home kitchen operations or MECOs that are small scale food businesses. And we anticipate that MECOs are gonna provide an economic opportunity for communities of color, ethnically diverse and women owned businesses. We created and posted online informational flyers about how to become a MECO operator, translated into five languages, and we're sharing this information with community organizations, city agencies, and to all the county library locations. So far, we have 27 MECOs throughout the region that have been permitted and six more are in process. DEHQ continues to focus on streamlining operations through innovative projects that resulted in approximately $459,000 in cost savings for our customers. These projects included implementing the plan check digital portal review and the plan check inquiry form in our food and housing division, as well as shifting from paper to virtual plan review for underground storage tanks. We hosted opportunity for a youth and career readiness program that focused on green jobs, where our DEHQ team members provided mentorship and coaching to provide an experience for these youth to learn about civic engagement, public service, and science-based program implementation that protects the health and the vitality of the community. By July 1st, DEHQ will have successfully implemented board direction to transition the oversight of 129 small public water systems to the California Water Resources Control Board, which benefits customers by providing them access to state water system technical engineering staff and alternate state funding programs for assistance. Looking forward, we will continue to protect the environment, enhance public health, and prevent disease with approximately 70% of our recommended budget continuing efforts in the areas of food safety and foodborne illness prevention, hazardous material regulation, and vector surveillance and mosquito treatment. The remaining 30% will continue to support various programs such as our 24-7 emergency hazmat response team, inspection of swimming pools, water wells, and septic construction, housing investigations, and monitoring beach water quality sampling. In addition to the investments in our regulatory programs, DEHQ will continue with a focus on serving the underserved. This includes continuing the community needs assessments that began last year in our HAZMAT program to evaluate, analyze, and identify potential unpermitted HAZMAT facilities within underserved communities to decrease the risk for hazardous material releases or mismanagement of hazardous waste. Using an educational approach, over 25 unpermitted facilities have been contacted and guided towards compliance with hazardous material regulations. We will start a community needs assessment in our vector control program, focusing on providing education in the underserved communities about pests that can transmit disease and how to protect against the diseases that they carry and identify service gaps and needs. In our food program, we've collected data from 60% of our restaurants and food facilities regarding their preferred language and secondary languages so that we can meet translation and interpretation needs of operators to enhance food safety. DEHQ's recommended budget includes staffing to support each of our programs with increased efforts in data-driven decision-making, evidence-based policy analysis, and community assessment and engagement. 
This will enable DEHQ to better understand our data and evaluate our data so that we can make programmatic decisions to make improvements in our programs, better connecting with the communities we serve. Staff will lead existing efforts in the areas of equity, justice, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, as well as DEHQ's efforts related to sustainability, climate, and environmental justice. We will also continue to focus on supporting our staff through workforce development initiatives, training in both technical and soft scoff skill development, and utilizing teleworking and alternate work schedules. Our metrics show that by teleworking, our DEHQ employees avoided 2.3 million miles of driving since 2020. This eliminated emissions and is equal to the amount of electricity that's needed to power 104 homes in one year. DEHQ is also committed to maintaining fiscal stability and will monitor potential grant opportunities such as the federal infrastructure grants and proactively identify projects and funding available that can enhance public and environmental health programs. Sustainability is at the forefront of our operations and regulatory program impl implementation. Examples of how DEHQ is working towards sustainable operations include converting our existing fleet due for replacement to electric vehicles where possible to reduce emissions from gasoline powered vehicles, and continuing the board directed permit fee reductions and waivers to support compliance with public health and environmental regulations and incentivize additional housing in the unincorporated communities. And we also balance employee well being and achieving our sustainability goals. We're reviewing office space to identify where shared spaces or hubs can be utilized as a result of teleworking. DEHQ applies an equitable lens in service delivery and program design to provide opportunities for underserved communities. Some examples include investigating 100% of childhood-led poisoning cases referred by county public health services within the required timeline per state guidelines, providing timely response to complaints or requests for service to prevent and control vector-borne disease, and collaborating with county departments on the development of the county's socially equitable cannabis program by ensuring operator compliance with state hazmat permitting regulations. We are focused on empowering our workforce and operations by providing opportunities for staff growth, training and development, ensuring excellence in customer service, and securing continuity of our operations. Collaborating with staff, regulated businesses, stakeholder industry groups, and community partners allows DEHQ to foster new ideas, implement best practices, and pursue innovation for operational excellence. Some examples include expanding our commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion and belonging by utilizing community needs assessment methods, increasing translated materials, and training staff on increasing their awareness and inclusivity when serving DEHQ's diverse customers. Through collaboration and partnership and meaningful conversations, DEHQ incorporates input and feedback for improved program and service delivery. Some examples include collaborating with charitable feeding organizations to provide outreach and to continue to register and permit charitable feeding operations to promote safe food donation in the region, and proactively performing comprehensive vector-borne disease surveillance to monitor and detect vector disease risks to public health through routine placement of traps, testing of vectors, which include mosquitoes, rodents, and ticks. Additionally, DEHQ protects the community by ensuring hazmat facilities recertify their business plans to ensure that our emergency responders have access to the most current information about the quantities and types of materials on site and that the public is aware of the chemical hazards present in the community and offering interpreters for community meetings or translation of information. DEHQ strives to implement public and environmental health regulatory programs in a fair and equitable manner. DEHQ's enforcement program team members make every effort to apply environmental laws and regulations consistently and justly. Some examples include supporting the Board of Supervisors' declaration of the public health crisis in the Tijuana River Valley by performing daily review of the conditions that are impacting the beach water quality in the South County and participating in the South County Environmental Justice Task Force. We are also continuing the community needs assessment in our HAZMAT program, providing education and offering translation where needed. 
For fiscal years 22 through 24, DEHQ will continue performance metrics such as ensuring the incidence of locally acquired West Nile virus mosquito-borne disease remains below one case per 100,000 people, and responding to 100% of foodborne illness complaints within three business days. And we're also adding a performance measure this year to notify beachgoers in less than 24 hours of sample results when there are water contact advisories or closures. DEHQ is proposing a $58.5 million recommended budget for fiscal year 22-23, which is an increase of $3.4 million from the current fiscal year. DEHQ's recommended budget was developed with a data-driven equitable lens and takes into account the opportunity to use $1.7 million in department one-time resources and board-directed offsets to help reduce fiscal impacts to customers and the community. Fees represent 58% of DEHQ's total pro proposed budget revenue. Other revenue sources include 5% in general purpose revenue, of which 900,000 is for board-directed fee reductions and waivers, and the remaining 37% of our budget is comprised of various revenue sources that have restricted uses, such as our vector benefit assessment and service charge, which is a levy on real property that pays for mosquito surveillance or vector disease control. And we have various other uh, state and federal revenue contracts and grants and health realignment funds. When determining our staffing levels, we evaluate new state mandates or requirements while also uh, closely monitoring and reviewing our program's permit volume, workload, and revenue impacts. In this recommended operational plan, DEHQ is requesting to add 20 staff in order to support board-directed programs or initiatives, including increased efforts in community engagement, policy development and implementation, and data analysis to support evidence-based decision-making and resource allocation. Staff will also be able to focus on environmental justice efforts in underserved communities that may be impacted by potentially unpermitted hazmat facilities. And we'll also be able to address workload increases and shorter plan review times, which are requested by customers. The requested staff also support the implementation of the newly uh, temporary authorized MECO program. This concludes our presentation and we're avail available to answer any questions. Thank you. Vice Chair Vargas. Um, around MECOs this year, I know there's been a lot um, uh, done there, and, but I wanted to again ask you about the equity tool and how you all were able to to use it um, in your process. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Vargas. Um, as my, some of my colleagues have mentioned, it really, uh, the, the tool was a great complement to the community needs assessment work that we've uh, been doing in the department. Um, as an example, in our, in our HAZMAT program, last year we began a community needs assessment and added some staffing uh, to focus on uh, the, the data where we saw that there were potentially unpermitted uh, facilities in um, disadvantaged communities. And we use the Healthy Places Index and Cal Enviro Screen data sets to overlay with our regulatory program data. And um, using that budget equity assessment tool and, and included in this budget, uh, we are asking for additional staff to evolve that program even more. We're also um, utilizing the budget equity tool to focus on translation and interpretation where we can increase that to really um, help operators when they have uh, language needs um, to help them gain even better compliance. And we're excited about the coming year and doing even more in this area in our vector control program where we looked at our request for service data and uh, the complaint data and we overlaid that with the um, underserved community data sets. And what we saw is um, there's some opportunity for us to proactively go out into some communities where we're not seeing a lot of requests for service to um, deliver information in multiple languages in those communities so that they know that this service is there for them. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Libraries. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and members of the board. My name is Miguel Acosta and I have the honor of working alongside the ded dedicated staff of the County Library. I am eager to share with you our recommended operational plan. Our vision is shaped by our four guiding principles of equitable access to learning, energizing civic engagement, 
promoting reading and inspiring creativity and cultural appreciation. Our mission statement demonstrates that public libraries are the ultimate customizable government services. Our customers may want to learn a new language, use our technology to find a new job, gain a new skill, or apply for safety net services. They can get an accredited high school diploma or become a naturalized citizen. Or they might be seeking relief from the heat while we function as a cool zone or help in a community's recovery effort when we function as a local assistance center. The county library operates 33 branch libraries which serve all the unincorporated communities and 11 of the region's 18 incorporated cities. But many of our customers visit and use our facilities no matter where they reside in the region. To better serve remote and underserved communities, we operate five automated book dispensing kiosks and soon four electric bookmobiles, which will replace our two diesel powered bookmobiles. We've also created a rapidly expanding digital library, the second largest in the state and fifth in the nation. And most recently, the library has partnered with county departments and local organizations to install and support a growing network of little free libraries. I would like to highlight some of our accomplishments for fiscal year 21-22. In early April, we expanded our hours of operation to include weekend and evening hours. Our six largest branches are open seven days a week and every library has at least one evening available to their customers. Staff from every branch participated in planning for this expansion and we use data from customer transactions to identify the optimum set of business hours. We also plan to reintroduce literacy classes for our very youngest customers. These story time hours promote reading and literacy and encourage adult caregivers to continue the reading experience at home. Library staff also completed a major overhaul of our public facing technology systems to increase customer service, expand library service beyond our branches and offer multilingual access to our online catalog and website. The online catalog has a new calendar of events with location and mapping features and links to related events. Coming soon is an option for community groups to reserve our community rooms online. We will prioritize community planning sponsor groups and other agencies working to help their communities. Our new online catalog brings together in a single site our collection of more than 1 million physical items and nearly half a million ebooks and audiobooks. Customers can also access a shared catalog of more than 45 million items available from more than 55 academic and public libraries across California. The online catalog can be searched in Spanish, Filipino, Chinese, Vietnamese, English, and Russian. Our system doesn't completely align with the board's list of threshold languages but we are working with our system vendor towards that goal. The online catalog uses advanced technology to offer customers alternative titles when the book they want is being used by others. Customers can also read book reviews, browse a book's table of contents, and get real-time availability details of our collection. The final element of our technology update is our automated sorting system, dubbed the Big Super Sorter, by a visiting group of third grade students from their school's introductory robotics program. This technology prioritizes ergonomics and has reduced delivery time of library materials between branches from nine days to one single day, which puts books and library materials into the hands of our customers faster than ever. The big super sorter can process 3000 items per hour and has greatly improved our efficiency. Before we turn to next year's goals, I would like to share this image of the little free library we installed at the Hamilton Elementary School. In March of 2021, your board voted unanimously to install little free libraries across San Diego County to provide easier access to books and boost literacy in underserved communities. We successfully installed 40 little free libraries, which provides, provide access to free books that are diverse, inclusive, multilingual, and age appropriate. The program continues to expand with an additional 60 installations planned for next fiscal year for a total of 100 Little Free Libraries. Since our first installation, over 20,000 books have been exchanged throughout San Diego County. 
I would like now to share some of our plans for next fiscal year. In support of the county's sustainability goals and in pursuit of creating a zero carbon library, we will replace and retire two diesel burning bookmobiles with a fleet of four zero emission mobile outreach transports. We are expanding our mobile outreach services to include not only books and information, but classes in science, technology, engineering, and math, early literacy, financial literacy, and legal research. The State Library of California will award the county library $167,000 towards this transition as part of their grant initiative called Stronger Together. Next, we will continue to expand the scope and reach of our digital library with the addition of a resource that provides access to hundreds of newspapers from 120 countries in 60 languages on a smartphone, tablet, or computer. Local newspapers include the San Diego Union Tribune and the Los Angeles Times. Newspapers from the world's capitals are included with instantaneous translation to dozens of languages. The county library wants to help our residents from around the world keep in touch with their countries of origin in their native languages, as well as facilitate access to primary news sources at a global level. Library staff, in conjunction with early childhood development researchers at San Diego State University, have created a kindergarten readiness program for children age zero to five and their adult caregivers. The program focuses on the social and emotional aspects of school readiness. Adult caregivers, meanwhile, are presented with classes on nutrition, health, and school resources while providing a safe space to form bonds and network with other caregivers. Next fiscal year, in conjunction with the California State Library, we will take our program and create an online toolkit for library jurisdictions throughout the state to implement in their own communities. The online toolkit will be professionally produced with funding from the State Library and will feature how-to videos for each activity, data, co data collection methods, a list of resources available to libraries statewide, such as First Five, and more. Next, the map you see on this slide demonstrates just one feature of our new data analysis tool that combines census data, library transaction data, and marketing data to help us better understand the communities we serve so that we can plan library services and focus our collections on the best way to serve our communities. Next fiscal year, our staff will continue to receive training and toolkits to support their community engagement efforts. The county's, the county library's programs and services align to the county's new strategic plan in the following ways. For sustainability, the library will, will partner with Parks and Recreations and Planning and Development Services on a tree canopy project to increase green spaces and decrease shade gaps at our branches. We will invest $75,000 next fiscal year towards this effort. These images show our Pine Valley and Borrego Springs libraries and the important impact trees can have on our community spaces. We're also planning to create seed libraries at appropriate branches based on data in the Food Access Opportunity Tool to support food sustainability. A seed library provides gardening information, classes, and starter seed packets, perhaps to be used in a community garden. Finally, our metrics also show that by teleworking, our library employees avoided 430,000 miles of driving since 2020. This eliminated, eliminated tailpipe emissions equal to the amount of le electricity needed to power 24 homes for one year. <clears throat> we will continue to remove barriers to earning a high school diploma by offering an accredited high school diploma program to resident adults 18 and over. The library anticipates serving approximately 30 graduates in the next fiscal year and we have passed the notable milestone of 110 graduates since we introduced the program in 2018. We are simplifying access to the program and residents can sign up at the website libraryhighschool.org. During uh, fiscal year 22-23, the library will provide citizenship classes and free application help to lawful permanent residents at branches and underserved communities through a partnership with Jewish Family Service of San Diego. 
Next year, the library will allocate up to $176,000 in funding towards this initiative. The goal of this initiative is to increase access to citizenship classes and immigration services where there are limited or no credible options. By offering this initiative, the library supports the county's overall goal to advance equity and opportunity in immigrant communities. We extend access to broadband internet to our customers wherever they live, work, and study. We will soon begin the distribution and availability of 7,000 internet kits, which consists of a laptop and Wi-Fi hotspot, so our customers can have access to the internet for their educational and career needs. The images shown here highlight library customers participating in a pilot program of lending uh, Wi-Fi hotspots at our Spring Valley and Fallbrook libraries. The pilot project was funded by the State Library of California and we loaned nearly 400 hotspots. <clears throat> libraries are open to all and everyone is welcome. Libraries play a vital role in the life of the communities they serve. Our programs are free, well curated, culturally enriching, and we delight in convening county agencies and nonprofit organizations to meet and serve residents at our facilities. We collect mail ballots, host HHSA staff signing up CalFresh and MediCal recipients, host Cal Fire for COVID testing and vaccination, connect vets with the Office of Military and Veteran Affairs at our Vet Connect offices, sponsor art exhibits for emerging artists host fix-it clinics, which invite residents to repair damaged appliances, thus saving them from the landfill. We also offer chair yoga and tai chi classes for seniors, provide free meals and after-school snacks to students, help customers learn new technologies, and provide a safe space for teenagers to meet and study. In early October, we expect to be opening the Lakeside Library, which features a 2,000 square foot community room, generates its own energy via solar panels, has free Wi-Fi, laptops and computers, study rooms, and so much more. Also shown is one of the two public art installations. The artists invited Lakeside residents to provide input to the creative process, and the resulting pieces reflect the local environment. We will also begin the contract and design work for the new Casa de Oro Library and the expansions of the Julian and Rancho San Diego libraries. Our Santee branch manager has been working with Las Colinas Detention and Reentry Facility to provide books for incarcerated individuals for pleasure reading and to read to their children during in-person and virtual visits. When the individuals leave the facility, they are given the opportunity to receive a library card and information about the services that the library provides. The service started in October of 2021. And after the program participants served at the Las Colinas um, facilities showed consistent interest in getting library cards. The program was expanded to all six county detention and reentry facilities in January of this year. This program provides an inclusive opportunity for residents to integrate back into their communities. Our key performance measures include several categories that monitor the usage of our branch services and programs, which will grow as a result of our new expanded hours. We expect visits to our branches to increase to nearly 2 million. Wi-Fi sessions at our, at our branches will surpass 250,000 sessions, and our annual circulation of physical and digital library materials is likely to approach 10 million items. The county library is a special revenue department, and our operating budget, called the Library Fund, is financed by 0.7 of 1% of the property taxes collected in the communities we serve. The CAO, CAO recommended budget for next fiscal year is $57 million. As shown on the first row, this is an increase in expenditures of 2.9 million from the current fiscal year. In the current fiscal year, we received a one-time disbursement of 3.5 million from redevelopment agency funds and we reflect that by removing that same amount in next fiscal year's budget. Our recommended budget includes the addition of eight permanent staff. These staff will empower the library to respond to our communities and customers' needs for additional services and programs much more quickly. 
we will be adding five full-time staff to respond to workload increases, for example. We will be expanding our procurement and contracting unit to increase the speed by which we can expand our digital library. Additional staff will also help us to curate more world language books and communicate in all threshold languages. We will also add three full-time staff to help us respond to your board's priority to increase community engagement and make better use of data analytics to evaluate program effectiveness. These additional staff will increase our capabilities to engage with our communities and will enhance our data analysis capabilities to continue our transition of measuring outcomes instead of outputs and, used combi and use combined library transaction data, census data, and other data sources to more equitably serve our customers. We are also showing a decrease of $3.3 million in our budget due to the completion of one-time projects, such as the Lakeside Library opening day collection and completion of several maintenance projects. That concludes the library's presentations, and we're available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, and thank you for all the great work for, uh, on the little libraries, particularly to Laura, because I know she's been doing a lot with our little libraries, and I know that we're going to be able to get our 10 San Isidro schools um, with a little library, so I'm especially excited about that. Um, I want to just ask the same question about the equity tool and how uh, was it helpful for all of you and recommendations? Or sure. So the way we use the tool is we ran the tools questionnaire across each of the eight new positions we were adding to make sure we were hitting our equity goals and especially, and others have commented, the question of unintended consequence. It's so important for decision-making hygiene and it's always a good question to ask what can go wrong and so it sharpened our decision-making around it. But I have to say the best part of the tool was it was the mechanism by which we were engaging with staff from the Office of Equity and Social Justice because they were asking questions about our response. So we had great dialogue with them, you know, via Word document comments on some of the nuances around translation services and multilingual um, programs. That was really helpful. Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Um, yeah, thank you. And apologies for standing. I'm too much sitting. My back is not happy. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, the uh, couple of the libraries. Um, uh, you know, I think, as you know, my district has quite a number of county libraries and was hoping you could highlight uh, any of, uh, looking forward, what you see as any of the biggest um, accomplishments uh, that we're looking forward to in the Del Mar, Solana Beach, Encinitas, or Cardiff by the Sea libraries. And if you don't have that right now, uh, you could send it to me in an email. I, I, I will definitely follow up on email, but let me say generally, um, you know, two years ago we began this process of giving the tools to our branch managers and our branch staff to take our guiding principles and our system-wide goals and looking at the local data to see how they might either enhance some of those services or introduce new services. So each of our branches have kind of reported back on their plans and we can share that for those those branches. That would be great. And both backward looking but also forward looking as we look to the to the new budget. Oh, exactly. No, yeah. it is it is looking yeah, forward. I would appreciate it. Sure, you can go ahead and send it to me later, but thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, thank you for the presentation. We'll go back to Sarah. Any closing comments? Just thank you for having us here today and providing us with the opportunity to present the proposed budget. Yeah, thank you to the entire team. Uh, really wonderful and uh, thorough presentation of all the various departments. We, uh, we really appreciate all the work that went into uh, drafting and creating and certainly presenting, and we look forward to the continued budget efforts we have in front of us before we get to final adoption. Uh, let me ask the clerk if we have any public speakers on the <coughs> land use uh, and environment group uh, budget presentation. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have two total requests to speak, one in person and one by phone. We'll begin with the in-person speaker. I'd like to invite forward Audra. You'll have two minutes to address the board. Audra, so the idea is nice for you guys to want to do a lot of these things, but I don't feel like your plan is what you claim it is. I mean, in everything you're talking about, like 
2030, right? Well, they have an agenda 2030 where they don't want us to own anything and we'll be happy. We'll have to live in closed, condensed areas where they can control the people. And I feel like you're spending a lot of money, I mean, billions of dollars to do these things and implement this. And I mean, how are we gonna get to that kind of um, lifestyle with like electric vehicles if there's all these gas vehicles? What are you gonna do with those? The landfills are already um, full of stuff that you gotta worry about. Where are these um, lithium batteries gonna be placed when their life is um, over? Like. I, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, a lot of things that you want to do, it's just like adding staff and spending all this money while you're seeking additional funds past the billions of dollars that you actually have to spend. So it's just concerning because, you know, the idea would be nice that you want to like help the environment, but this is all based on a farce. I mean, there is no climate injustice going on. This is man-made stuff that's happening. The drought is here because it's man-made. I mean, we don't need to get rid of all these greenhouse gases in order to you know, have a better life. It's like all the things you wanna do are actually causing more trouble for people having to um, live this new way. And um, you know, it just doesn't, all I see is you know, the Great Reset being played here. And that's kind of terrifying because that's a lot of money that you guys have taken from the people to spend on this. And it's, pretty much impossible to do by the time you guys want to do it. You can never have zero carbon. Now we'll move to our remote uh, participant. I would remind the caller that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaker speaking. We'll begin with our first caller. Truth. The implementation of the regional decarbonization framework is increasing cost to taxpayers by $3 million to fundamentally transform all of our lives by reducing vehicle miles traveled through control of land use, implementing anti-idling for cars, preferred parking for electric vehicles, implementing complete streets, which means slower driving speeds, extra crosswalks in the middle of the road, wider bike lanes, narrower car lanes, extended curbs, bike and car shared lanes, et cetera. Parking reductions, altering driver behavior, and more. All of that information is directly from the decarbonization plan as stated in the February 9th, 2022 meeting. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There will be licensing or rules and fees on the use of curb space and public streets. And they admit that the transition to a carbon neutral economy economy may exacerbate wage inequality and disparities by race and gender, as green occupations can be low wage. All of that info is from the March 16, 2022 meeting. But the most traitorous spending of the $3 million via the LUEG is the bringing together of unelected regional governments with players inside and outside government, that's financial stakeholders, and an evolving governance structure to encourage collective experimentation for decarbonization. That's from the November 17, 2021 meeting. The University of California was paid 1.2 million, partly to help write that. I would have much preferred that money have gone to the library. And the $3 million to the decarb should be directly refunded back to the people. We want constitutional law followed, not a tyrannical evolving governance structure to conduct experiments on our lives. That concludes public comment. Chair Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, and I ask the clerk to uh, share some information for the public on continued opportunities to comment on the budget. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. There are several opportunities for the public to comment on the recommended operational plan. Members of the public may provide written comments on the budget. To comment online on the budget, please visit the county's website at www.sandiegocounty.gov slash budget. Additionally, the Board of Supervisors will begin the budget hearing process on Monday, June 13th, 2022 at 9 a.m. when the Board will receive public testimony on all areas of the budget. A second budget hearing is also scheduled for Thursday, June 16th, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Budget deliberations and adoptions are scheduled for Tuesday, June 28th, 2022 at 9 a.m. And the next regular meeting of the Board will take place on Tuesday, May 24th, 2022 at 9 a.m. 
All right, thank you. Not seeing any additional requests. Again, a huge thank you to county staff and team uh, for development of a great draft budget and wonderful presentations. Uh, this concludes our uh, two days of informational items, and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you all back at the uh, rest of our budget activities. With that, we stand adjourned. Thank you.